All right, good evening, everybody. Um, and happy birthday to Wilfred Owen, 18th of March, 1893. It's really nice to have so many people here for our annual, what I've started calling birthday lecture because it seems fitting. Um, and um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Martin Impey, um, who many of you may know already, hopefully from his wonderful book, which he's gonna speak about tonight, the illustrated edition of Hilkite Quorum Est. Um, his other books, um, you also might know, the wonderful Poppies series of children's books, which he illustrated with um, Hillary Robinson, who wrote the text. These are all of these, Flow of the Song. Um, and of course, um, a song for Will. I just thought I'd just show all these to everyone and encourage you to um, get a hold of them. If you haven't already, I'll put the links to Strauss House Productions in the chat. Um, for you to, to link through to. Um, but he's won numerous awards and um, we are really, really delighted. I'm really delighted and on behalf of the association um, to welcome him here tonight. So without sort of further ado, Martin, would you like to um, take over? Okay, thank you. Hi everyone. And uh, thanks for giving up your Friday to um, listen to me um, uh, share my my links, my stories, and um, my um, my journey to illustrating Dolce at the Cora Mest. Um, now, before I sort of move on to the, the talk directly, um, when I was going through, uh, there's, there, there, is no there, there isn't necessarily a chronological order to this talk. There are inspirational things that I've found along the way um, and um, I, that it's inspired my art. And I thought that um, that might be something you might enjoy. Um, War broke out and now the winter of the world with perishing great darkness closes in. That, that line resonates today, I feel, um, as does this little passage. And it's a letter from Colin, um, it's a letter to uh, Colin from Wilfred while he was away in, in France. And um, he put, I suppose you are studying the war with all your patrol because he was away with the scouts. Are the scouts doing anything really useful at, the at this time? I feel shame shamefully out of it up here, passing my time reading the newspapers in an armchair in a shady garden. Numbers of Bordeaux ladies are going to the armies as nurses. The only thing I can do, so Madame Leger says, would be to serve as stretcher bearer on the battlefield. After all my years of playing soldiers and then of reading history, I've, I have almost a mania to be in the East, to see fighting and to serve. For I like to think that this is the last war of the world. I have only a faint idea of what's going on and what it is felt in England, as perhaps you have only a faint notion of the family affliction, the public enthusiasm and standstill of business there is here. Please send me a newspaper whenever an important issue appears and keep some historical numbers for my archives. Yes, I should honestly and solemnly like to be an Alsace at the moment, but I know your opinion at home as to such an idea. So I won't even ask for permission to engage myself as a nurse, etc. What a time for journalists. It was that last line that really drew me. And then if you take these parts, and then just swap the words England and Alsace with Ukraine. It, uh, it, it, it kind of really uh, is relevant today. So it shows you that we are, um, we're continually living in a loop, I feel. Um, and we've just been lucky enough to, to live so long without anything um, too uh, disastrous on a, on a military front. Um, so my passion for the First World War started very, very young. Um, my earliest memories are um, uh, being brought up with, with my mum and my granddad and my nan. Um, my granddad used to sing songs to my mum and poems from the war. And um, my mum used to snuggle me down when I was very young and she would uh, tell me stories and sing me songs um, and memorise the poems that her dad had taught her one of which is the Kaiser's Dream, which I'm going to read to you because I've got a vision of being snuggled up in bed with my mum 
and she's reciting this poem to me. If you haven't heard it, it's, it's, it's a real good one. So, there's a story now current, though strange it may seem, of the great Kaiser Bill and a, and a wonderful dream. Being tired of the Allies, he lay down in bed, and amongst other things, he dreamt he was dead. On leaving the earth to heaven, he went straight. Arriving up there, he knocked at the gate. But St Peter looked out, and in a voice loud and clear, said, be gone, Kaiser Bill, we don't want you here. Well, said the Kaiser, that's very uncivil. I suppose after that I must go to the devil. So he turned on his heel and off he did go at the top of his speed to the regions below. And when he got there, he was filled with dismay for while waiting outside, he heard old Nick say to his imps, now look here, boys, I give you all warning. I'm expecting the Kaiser down here in the morning, but don't let him in for to me, it's quite clear. He's a very bad man and we don't want him here. If he ever gets in, we'll have no end of quarrels. In fact, I'm afraid he'll corrupt our good morals. Oh, Satan, dear friend, the Kaiser then cried. Excuse me for listening while waiting outside. If you don't admit me, then where can I go? Indeed, said the devil, I really don't know. Oh, do let me in, for I'm feeling quite cold. And if you want money, I've got plenty of gold. Let me sit in a corner, no matter how hot. No, no, said the devil. Most certainly not. We do not admit folks for riches and wealth. Here's a hair of sulphur and matches. Make a hell for yourself. Then he kicked William out and vanished in smoke. And just at that moment, the Kaiser awoke. He jumped out of bed in a shivering sweat and said, well, that dream I shall never forget. That I won't go to heaven, I know very well, but it's really too bad to be kicked out of hell. So that's the Kaiser's dream. And, and like I say, I could almost recite the whole thing at one point when I was very young, because mum used to read it to me and I loved it. And I thought I'd share that, that little memory with me. Now this, this uh, lady was instrumental in my uh, life as a storyteller, um, albeit as a visual storyteller. This is my, my nan, my grandmother, and um, it's, it's a perfect photograph of her. Um, and um, she was born in 1899. So she's, um, she's seen some incredible or saw some incredible things in her lifetime. And we didn't have many pictures of Nan, but if there was ever a picture that was sum my Nan up, this was it. She was, uh, she, she was in service at some point in her life. So she was always of the everything will last forever mode. So um, we'd have, she's, she's repaired her, her cardigan there too many times. She's outside in her slippers and her penny, exactly as I remember. And when I was very young, I used to go around and I'd stay with my nan. And um, she, every, every weekend she'd boil a ham and we'd cut these big doorsteps of bread and she'd sit me by the fire and start telling me stories about her life. And um, the, she would tell me mostly the stories of the big impacts in her life, which were really the First and Second World War. And um, during the First World War, living in London, uh, she got a job here at um, the Woolwich Arsenal. Obviously this is, I would assume, before the war because um, there were no women there. Um, and um, this is what it looks like now. So she would recognize the front, but obviously the back uh, factory is gone. And my nan got a job there and she was, um, one of the women working in the factories, making explosives and bombs. And my mum bought my nan a book um, years ago, I remember it, called Women at War. And my nan looked through it and she, she couldn't believe it. She said, this is, this is the desk I used to work at, and this is my boss. And um, she used to work with these high explosives, extremely dangerous job. And um, she, would, uh, she would tell me about how it, the cordite and explosive would stain her hands yellow and her face is yellow. And um, the locals, when they left the factories, used to call them canary girls. Um, so you've probably heard of those. So my nan was, uh, was a canary girl. Now there's another story where that she told me about um, when she was walking home from the factory one evening, it was, um, it was dark and she um, spied a zeppelin in the sky. And um, she described it to me as a kid. She was saying about there was these little <coughs> white things buzzing round. 
And um, she said she almost felt sorry for it when the searchlights found the Zeppelin um, because she knew that, um, that, that it was in trouble. Um, and then the next thing she said, the whole night sky lit up like day. And researching this, I think these are the photographs the, of the Zeppelin that my nan saw. So the little white buzzy things that she described were aeroplanes flying around the Zeppelin and one got the right shot and the whole Zeppelin blew up. Now I'm sharing this particular story with you because I was drawn to this um, uh, letter that Wilfred wrote to his mother on trying to uh, join the Royal Flying Corps. And he says, if I fall, I shall fall mightily. I shall be with Perseus and Icarus, whom I loved, and not Fritz, whom I do not hate. To battle with the Super Zeppelin, when he comes, this would be chivalry more than Arthur dreamed of. Zeppelin, the giant dragon, the child slayer, I would happily die in adventure against him. So there was a nice link to my, my own experiences, my own family's experiences, and what Wilfred's describing there, and what his desires to be that pilot that shot, uh, that shot the Zeppelin down. My nan then would tell me about her two brothers. This is the older brother, Percy, and he was, uh, he was a soldier in the Royal Fusiliers before the war started. So at the beginning of the war, in August 4th, 1914, he was, um, he was already on a ship heading over across the channel. Um, and he was in the first action at Mons where he was captured. And this is a photograph of him in 1915. And this is clearly not his jacket. And you can see there they've hidden the cap badge on the, on the cap. So it's a generic uh, scene for all the soldiers to be, all the prisoners to be uh, photographed. And um, he was a tough guy. He was uh, as an old contemptible as they were described. He used to come round when I was a baby in the pram and uh, insist on pushing me around the block. So even as a baby, I had a, a First World War veteran pushing me around the block and my, maybe my connection even started then. Um, he escaped three times from a prisoner of war camp and the third time he escaped to freedom. So um, a real uh, uh, hero for me. These are his medals, I'm lucky enough to have these. And um, then my nan, so we're still at my nan's, she's telling me, uh, we're in a lounge and she's telling me about my, her brothers, my great uncles. And then she tells me about Arthur. And um, she said her younger brother she, that she was closest with. And she said, you know, how much she loved Arthur and how she wanted uh, him to not go to war. But um, he, he joined up and she said she remembered the last time she ever saw him. And um, she waved him off and in his uniform and said, you know, how amazing and smart he looked. Um, but then she'd, she'd get upset. And, um, and I'm only about six, seven years old, maybe. And I said to my nan, um, you know, why, why are you getting upset? And she said, oh, well, it's because he went away and I don't know what happened to him. I only know he was killed in the First World War, but I don't know where, I don't know when. So I said, nan, uh, I promise you one day I will find out what happened to him for you. And she said that would be amazing. So time went on. My nan was elderly then and um, she passed away naturally. And, um, and then in my early 20s, which was last year, um, I, uh, um, I decided to, um, I thought this, this memory popped in my head about this promise that I'd given to my nan and to see if I could find my great uncle. I did some research. Um, the um, author and historian Lynn MacDonald helped me at the time because, of course, we didn't have um, the internet and things then. And I found him and he was a rifleman. I only had his name to go on. And Arthur James Sainty, 1st and 5th Battalion, uh, London Rifle Brigade. And he was killed at the Battle of the Somme and he was only 19 years old. So the next thing was to, to go on a pilgrimage out there go to find out where he was. So he's at Sayre Road number two, um, and uh, he's down just between these trees here. There's a little sketch that I did when I went out there with my sketchbook. And there's his grave. And um, I was the first member of my family in over 75 years to even know where he was. And 
went out there and well, I remember standing, I took this wreath of poppies and messages from the family. And I remember standing by his grave and thinking, how am I gonna let my nan know that I'd found him um, all those years later? Um, so I, being the illustrator and the artist, I'd always got a little pot of water on me. So I tipped that out and I got some soil from his grave and I put it in this pot and I brought it home and I went to my nan's grave and I tipped the soil onto my nan's grave and said, there's the promise that I kept when I was in your lounge that I found, I found your brother. So this, this story has, has kind of, it's been a link for me um, and um, it's, it's been a connection um, that people seem to connect with, um, with my uh, family links to the First World War. So after that, um, in my professional career, I was given a, a um, commission um, by uh, Oxford University Press. And um, I believe the um, editor that um, gave me that job is actually on this talk this evening. And I remember, she'll remember it, Alison. Um, and um, she, I remember the phone call, she rung me up, she goes, I've got a job for you. She goes, I'm just gonna say two, uh, two words. I said, what's that? She said, war horse. And I just said, give me the job. And um, so that's, that was my first commission into illustrating books for children for the first in, in, on the subject of the First World War. Then um, uh, author Hilary Robinson and myself decided to create this book, Where the Poppies Now Grow. We couldn't get any publishers interested in it because they said that children wouldn't connect with the First World War on such a level and it was too difficult a subject to teach children. We disagreed and um, so uh, these were eventually published and since 2014 this one is currently being uh, where the poppies now grow is currently being reprinted for an eighth time the Christmas truce I think has been reprinted five times so we kind of proved a point there and then there's another book that um, that Jane kindly mentioned at the start uh, song for will and the lost gardeners of Heligan it's a story about the, um, the gardeners, that was 14 gardeners, outdoor staff that left the Lost Gardens of Heligan in Cornwall. They left to fight in the First World War and only four came home. And that's a very moving story about real life characters. Um, so that again has given lots of friendships and links and you know the, the, the subject just keeps on giving if you're prepared to put the time in. And then after all that, so I'd done, served my apprenticeship um, as an illustrator, I was asked to create my vision of Wilfred Owen's masterpiece, Dolce et Decorum Est. But the question was, how do I create images worthy of this text? And it was just unbelievably daunting. And um, to start with, it was almost a, a poison chalice because I was so excited and uh, I didn't know where to start. So I thought to start with, I've got to get close to Owen himself. And um, so this involved studying his manuscripts, understanding more um, about his references and um, the visual references and influences in his life. And so began hundreds of sketches and thoughts of mine, and not to mention thousands of, um, of miles uh, traveled. Um, this is a view looking into the cellar of the Forester's house. I thought that was quite interesting looking from the front looking in because I don't think many people bother because you can go in there and um, but that's a story for another day. So I, I started to keep a, a journal and a sketchbook and just just started to sketch things as I as I sort of felt and, and as I was learning and reading about him um, uh, this and but the old man would not sow but slew his son and half the seed of Europe one by one. Arms and the boy, that's not okay to call a mess, but getting to know Wilfred means you've got to get to know his work. And um, there's uh, the boys who will never grow old. This was my sort of epiphany for my um, dedication that I would want for the book. So these are just little journals in there. And um, I'm gonna share with you, many of you will know some of these little um, anecdotes and stories about Owen, but I'm conscious that some won't. And um, so I'm just going to touch on a few points. He was a, a lover of the romantics, especially Keats, um, the writings and his early writings reflected this. 
but I just like to share this with you because it was never meant to be a public letter. And it was just a, a letter that he sent to Mary, his sister on, on her 21st birthday. And it's just beautifully written. No more nonsense now, but just my very dearest wishes for the best years of my darling sister. May they be without cloud or ruffle of storm. May they each be long years, that is to say, full. And may they be full of good, filled from heaven. You will speak for me when you look up to God, and I will stand by you for as long as we move among men. In other words, I am gentle sister, always your brother. I mean, goodness me, he didn't need a card or a present or anything after that. That's just such a beautiful piece of writing. And, and he's not making an effort to have that published. So he's not, that's just how he wrote. And it's just glorious. This is, um, this is wholly relevant to myself um, because in April, 1911, he writes to his mother. I have all too short a time to, to make my pilgrimage to Tynmouth. I have bought a, at last a life of Keats and began this morning with fear and trembling to learn the details of his life. And in another letter, he writes, uh, I long to tell you of my good fortune in discovering the house of Keats. I will only say now that I saw it. I gaped at it and regardless of people in the window who finally became quite alarmed, I fancy, to my heart's content. Um, I can relate to this and we'll, we'll pop back to that um, uh, in, in a little bit further on. Um, but there was also, I started some pilgrimages to um, understand him and just to get to know him. So I had a pilgrimage to the Birkenhead and the Wirral and I found his aunt and uncle's house uh, where, he, where he would go for holidays. And um, in a letter he mentions, there are miles of fields in front of the house and it's not far from the sea. Well, when I went there, it was very urbanized. So it changed quite a bit, I think, since he uh, would recognize it. But I followed his, his footsteps down to the most obvious way down to Mel's um, uh, on the coastline where he would, um, where he would go and spend some time uh, playing on the beach. And, and um, when it, I don't know if you can see that on your screen, but when I got down there, I was very excited because a rainbow appeared as I, as I went, was there and took it as a sign. Not, I don't know what of, but I took it for a sign anyway. And then um, th I took this photograph of the beach at uh, Mel's and I then thought, hmm, is it just me or I took another photograph here. This is the, um, that's the rainbow there, but this looks kind of familiar to me because so there's a there's his beach that he went to on holiday and there's the um the i think that's passchendaele um so they're kind of there are there are um reflections of his life maybe to come um i was lucky enough to be um interviewed on bbc one on the wilfred owen um special the 100th anniversary special so i was able to get into Christchurch at Birkenhead and um, go to all round the back. So I walked the steps uh, uh, Wilfred would have walked with his mother because uh, that was obviously a church that they frequented. And um, they lived in three, three homes in Birkenhead. So the whole time I'm drawing and writing and, and just buzzing on just retracing his steps. And Seven Elm Grove uh, was one of the houses that he lived. And Colin, his brother, was was born there. And I looked at the front door and it to me, that looks like that could even be the same front door. I like to think maybe it is. And then just down the road from there was 14 Wilmer Road. And I stood outside um, just as uh, Owen had uh, outside Keats's house. And um, there we go. There's a reminder. I long to tell you of my good fortune of discovering the house of Keats. Because when I was stood outside this house taking pictures, someone came out and asked what I was doing. What was I doing there? Why was I taking pictures of the houses? And was I the landlord? So maybe they owned, they owed some rent or something. But um, I felt again, this was a history repeating itself. Um, and then there's the last address that he lived at, at um, in, in Birkenhead. 
the left hand side one there. Then we just just a very brief overview of um, his beginnings in, in the First World War enlists in the 30th, uh, the 20th, 3rd 28th London Regiment, which soon becomes the Artist Rifles. And um, I don't know if you can see that, but I've got one of these original cat badges. Um, he's commit on the June 1916, he's commissioned into the Manchester Regiment. Then July 1916, he's uh, achieves the first class shot. So he's a marksman as, as they would be now. And um, so clearly, a, a good soldier, a good soldier in the making. And um, near the end of 1916, so thank God he's missed the Somme, um, the Battle of the Somme, but um, he's sent to France after becoming a second lieutenant in the Manchester Regiment. Again, I've got an original cat badge there that, um, that Wilfred would have, would have recognized. These things I have around me, almost like a medium does when they say, oh, can I have something of the person? I have music playing, I have items around me all the time trying to connect with the subject. Um, and then uh, on the 12th of January 1917, Wilfred is in charge of A Company at Serre. So the, hence the, the relevance of telling you my family story um, with my great uncle buried at Serre. And um, uh, Wilfred writes, uh, on the 16th of January 1917, my own sweet mother, I'm sorry you've had about five days letterless. I can see no excuse for deceiving you about the last these last four days. I have suffered seventh hell. I've not been at the front. I've been in front of it. I held an advanced post, that is, a dugout in the middle of no man's land. It was, of course, dark, too dark, and the ground was not mud, not sloppy mud but an octopus of slucking, uh, sucking clay, three, four and five feet deep, relieved only by craters full of water. Men have been known to drown in them. Three quarters dead, I mean each of us, three quarters dead. My dugout held 25 men tight packed, water filled it to a depth of one or two feet, leaving say four feet of air. I mean, utterly horrendous conditions, but these descriptions, are gold to someone like myself that are trying to, I can see all this as he's describing it. Um, the Germans knew we were staying there and decided we shouldn't. Those 50 hours were the agony of my happy life. Every 10 minutes on Sunday afternoon seemed like an hour. I nearly broke down and let myself drown in the water that was now slowly rising over my knees. I was chiefly annoyed by our machine guns from behind. The sing 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 of the bullets reminded me of Mary's canary. On the whole, I can support the canary better. In the platoon on my left, the sentries over, over the dugout were blown to nothing. One of these poor fellows was my, was my first servant whom I rejected. If I had kept him, he would have lived, for servants don't do sentry duty. I kept my own sentries halfway down the stairs during the more terrific bombardment. In spite of this, one lad was blown down and I'm afraid blinded. Um, so that's, that event took place just to the side of Sare Road number two, where my great uncle's buried. And that event also inspired the poem, The Century. Um, and there's some moments, there's some uh, descriptions in The Century, which I found most interesting when illustrating the book. We dredged it up for dead until he whined. Oh, sir, my eyes, I'm blind, I'm blind, I'm blind. Coaxing, I held a flame against his lids and said if he could see the, the least blurred light, he was not blind. In time, they'd get all right. I can't, he sobbed, eyes huge, bulged like squids. Watch my dreams still. So those descriptions are very similar to um, uh, the, some descriptions that we see and hear in Dolce at the Coromest, his nightmares, his dreams and the descriptions of these bulging eyes. There's another view from the top end, looking down at Sarah Road number two. Um, and then further up, um, looking out to the back of Sarah Road, up to the horizon is, um, is where Munich Trench is located, uh, where his experiences um, uh, 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 inspired his poem Exposure. And when you stand there in the winter and you feel and hear that wind 
you can you can really understand where he was coming from with that. Um, and then on the 25th of April 1917, he writes to his mother, I think the worst incident was one wet night when we lay up against a railway embankment. A big shell lit on the top of the bank just two yards from my head before I awoke. I was blown in the air right away from the bank. I passed most of the following days in a railway cutting in a hole just big enough to lie in and covered with corrugated iron. My brother officer, B Company 2nd Lieutenant Gork Roger, lay opposite in a similar hole, but he was covered with earth and no relief will ever relieve him, nor will his rest be a nine day rest. I mean, you know, if that doesn't give the, put the hairs on end on your arms, I don't know what will. Um, and then he writes again. So this is the start of him getting uh, one of the most important parts of his writing um, is a journey that he begins with this because it's the start of him um, uh, having shell shock. So a few days later, he writes again to his mother here again, because he's at that 13th casualty clearing station. The doctor suddenly was moved to forbid me to go into action next time the battalion go, which will be in a day or two. I did not go sick or anything, but he's ner he is nervous about my nerves and sent me down yesterday, labelled neurasthenia. Do not for a moment suppose I, I've had a breakdown. I'm simply avoiding one. Now they're quite, they're quite graphic descriptions, but that's him toning it down for his mother. But um, a few days after that, he's, he writes to his sister a bit more candidly. You know, it was not the Bosch that worked me up nor the explosives, but it was living so long by poor old Cock Robin, as we used to call Second Lieutenant Gork Roger, who lay not only nearby, but in various places around and about, if you understand. I hope you don't. This is my little sketch that appears in the book. It's a little nod to, to his brother officer. And there you can see when I was drawing it, and there's, there's uh, Manchester Regiment uh, shoulder titles there. Um, so really deeply, uh, deeply disturbing for him. This again is a, is a wonderful, I can't think of a better description of someone experiencing uh, going over the top. Dearest Colin, the sensations of going over the top are about exhilarate, as exhilarating as those dreams of falling over a precipice. When you see the rocks at the bottom surging up to you. I woke up without being squashed. Some didn't. There was an extraordinary exultation in the act of slowly walking forward, showing ourselves openly. There was no bugle and no drum, for which I was very sorry. I kept up a kind of chant in sing-song, keep the line straight, not so fast on the left, steady on the left, not so fast. Then we were caught in a tornado of shells. The various waves were broken up and we carried on like a crowd moving off a cricket field. When I looked back and saw the ground all crawling and wormy with bodies, I felt no horror at all, but only an immense exultation as to having got through the barrage. Um, there, this, this moment surely is his, um, his inspiration for um, Spring Offensive. Uh, again, it's, but it's just a wonderful description. And these, these are, he's answering questions I would ask him in his letters. Um, this is a very well documented uh, meeting when he, he, he gets sent to Craig Lockhart uh, War Hospital with shell shock. And um, there he meets um, uh, Siegfried Sassoon, who, um, who was sent there because he'd written a, a protest letter in the Times. And he wrote, I am making the, this statement as an act, act of willful defiance of the military authority, because I believe that the war is deliberately being prolonged by those who have the power to end it. I am a soldier convinced that I am acting on behalf of soldiers. I have seen the, and endured the sufferings of the troops and I can no longer be a party to prolonging these sufferings for ends which I believe to be evil and unjust. On behalf of those who are suffering now, I make this protest against the deception which is being practiced upon them. Also, I believe it may help to destroy the callous complacency with which the majority of those at home regard the continuous of ag continuance of agonies which they do not share and which they have not enough imagination to realize. 
Now, I shared that with you because three months earlier, Wilfred wrote in a, in a letter to his mother um, about uh, being relieved 12 days, um, sorry, un unrelieved in the line. I think that the terrible long time we stayed unrelieved was unavoidable, yet it makes us feel bitterly towards those in England who might relieve us and will not. So they're very much on a, on a, on a par together. So it's no wonder that they became such good friends. Again, there's a description here. There is nothing very attractive. This is describing, Wilfred's describing um, Craig Lockhart. There is nothing very attractive about the place. It is a decayed hydro, far too of, full of officers, some of whom I know. And then um, Sassoon writes in Sherston's Progress, the war office had wasted no money in interior decoration. Consequently, the place had a, the melancholy atmosphere of a decayed hydro. They were destined to meet. Um, so that story with their meeting is, is for a whole nother talk for someone uh, with more knowledge than I, but, um, but it's still very fascinating and interesting. And there's one more I wanna share with you from there. And he writes to his cousin, Leslie Gunston. At last, I have an event worth a letter. I have been known myself to Siegfried Sassoon. Last night when I went in, he was struggling to read a letter from Wells, whose handwriting is not only a slurred suggestion of words, but in dim pink ink, writes the deadbeat in the style of Sassoon. And that's how he writes it in his, um, in his letter. Sassoon's feedback to him was, so the last thing he says was, sweat your guts out writing poetry, eh, says I? Sweat your guts out, I say. And just for those that don't know, the Wells in that letter is H.G. Wells. So he's, um, he's really starting to move in the right, inspiring circles. His first experience of gas, so we're getting closer now to the subject that I'm uh, most interested in for my visual references. He wrote this to his, um, to his mother. Uh, we are now a long way back in a ruined village, all huddled together in a farm. We all sleep in the same room where we eat and try to live. My bed is a hammock of rabbit wire stuck up a, beside a great shell hole in the wall. Snow is deep about and melts through the gaping roof, on, roof onto my blanket. We are wretched beyond my previous imagination, but safe. Last night, indeed, I had to go up with a party. We got lost in the snow. I went on ahead to scout, foolishly alone. And when, half a mile away, from the party got overtaken by gas. It was only tear gas from a shell and I got safely back to the party in my helmet with nothing worse than a severe fright and a few tears, some natural, some unnatural. Um, and then we move on nine months and he's at Craig Lockhart when he writes to his mother. Here is the gas poem done yesterday, which is not private, but not final. The famous Latin tag means, of course, it is sweet and meat to die for one's country. Sweet and decorous. So he's referring to Dolce et Decorum Est. And um, I'll quickly run through it just for those that aren't 100% familiar with the poem. Um, Bent double like old beggars under sacks, not need coffin like hags we curse through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshot. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, 
you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dolce et decorum est, pro patria mori. So that is just beyond, beyond words. Um, again, there's a line here from the unreturning. Then fell a stillness such as hark appalled, when far gone dead return upon the world. There watched I for the dead, but no ghost woke. This was the moment that, um, that I finally found that I could offer something to this. This was the direction I was gonna go in. This was the first image I did. And I put finally the ghosts, all the research, all, the, all those passages, the letters had finally spoken to me. And I was, I was able to produce this image that gave me the confidence to then take the book to, to an, the next level. Um, through, uh, I was able to, through the lovely Jane um, here, I was able to um, gain access to Wilfred's original texts and manuscripts at Oxford and at the British Library. And um, I kept a little journal for myself. And um, I put here, today I find myself in the company of Wilfred Owen's manuscripts. My hands are shaking at the thought of touching the pages that W.O. touched down here. And there it is. He hands me the volume and actually I actually have it in my hands as if I have purchased it from a bookshop. No gloves needed. Just sit in the red zone, he says to me. So these are lovely memories for me um, when I'm sharing um, uh, Wilfred's uh, work and looking and um, uh, probably frightening a few people in there because I'm just pretty much overwhelmed. And I've written in my journal another line. I am. I am but looking over his shoulder and taking notes and enjoying watching him write. Um, as we can see there, Jesse Pope, he's the first um, manuscript is, is um, uh, she's the my friend, you would not speak with such high zest. And um, there's a poem there, who's for the game, that's worth looking up. But she gets a bit of a bad rap, uh, rap but um, really and truly, it, is that any worse than any of these? Um, because, you know, she's, these are speaking to the conscience of anyone that's still in, the, in, in England and the UK at the time. So maybe, maybe she, history has, has been harsh to her. Um, and then we've got other versions. You'll be able to see those in the book. Um, and then um, I'll, I'll show you how I created the front cover design. This image is the, the, an image that I wanted to have as almost, it's a poppy obviously, but I wanted it to give it a, a living, almost like a living organ and it's been shot. So that's why it's such the, the, this uh, blood-like and it's been shot and distorted and, and ruined and destroyed. And um, I had done a, an image, I was a member of the uh, Society of Floral Painters and um, I created an image similar to this for that at one point. So it was in the back of my head that one day I might use that again. These are the men, um, uh, these sketches of the men uh, trudging through the mud. So I thought that works. Created this, uh, give it some age. So I've created this, this aged background. And then I've dropped the, part of the poppy, the exploded poppy with the men and just given them a little highlight there drop the text in place and there's the cover and you know and someone very special wrote the foreword for me which I was eternally grateful for um, but um, even if the book had never sold a single copy no one could ever take the fact that my name was on the front cover of a book that had Wilfred Owen's name on it so you know if I never sell another book that's uh, that's good enough for me. Well, I say that, obviously I do want to sell more books. That's a bit of a lie, but you get the drift. Um, this image here is a retrospective image. We're following this character. He's walking through the mud. He's got his, his gas hood there and we're following him back, back through the past. And uh, this is the, 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 the um, dedication, which was inspired by um, Alfred Edward Hausman the lads in their hundreds, where at the, at the end of this line, the lads that will die in their glory, 
and never be old. That stayed with me ever since I read that. So I drew this, this uh, medical um, uh, soldier there and he's got a rum jar. So he's toasting the ghosts of these people here. And I'm just gonna stop sharing for a second so I can show you, this is a, a rum jar that uh, I had in that, um, uh, in that image, SRD, uh, service ration depot. And they would send rum up to the officers who would dish that out to the, to the soldiers. And um, they would, uh, just go back on there. And they would, they would say, well, what the, you, haven't, you haven't dished it all out. He said, don't worry about that. You, you just have your little bit of rum and have a bit of Dutch courage. So the, uh, the Tommies used to say SRD meant seldom reach destination. So, which was quite nice because they said the officers helped themselves to it. There's another expansion of the cover image. We've got the poppies as blood, looks almost like a crime scene. Um, and I wanted this dynamic. This is the first big image that you see in the book, bent double like old beggars under sacks. This is my interpretation of that line. Um, originally, um, it was discussed about having this typeset, but um, I kicked against that and said it needed to have it handwritten because it, it gives the ferocity of the words. So I created that with my, with my dip pen. And we've got a little pencil sketch repeat from the cover there. And um, the old beggars under sacks. This is, this is a, an image of a beggar in the street, um, which uh, maybe Wilfred would have been familiar with, given that he's referred to that line. And the sacks are the field capes, the Tommy's field capes. And uh, we can see them here. They were utilised as a Scottish regiment moving up the line. And there's a picture I took at um, the Flanders Museum, I think it is, um, showing you the colours. There's some waders on there. Looks a bit extreme, but you'll see some pictures in a minute that um, will show you just how, how utterly horrendous the conditions were. Um, there's someone slipping and falling in the mud and they're trying to help each other along. Not need coughing like hags. So we're not need, we're, we're not being able to balance properly. So because of the mud, so it's pulling at their legs as they raise them out. And I've done this before, tried to walk through mud and um, ended up falling over. So they're coughing in, they're, they're not in the best of health. health. And uh, these are some of my sketches. And some of these sketches I couldn't, um, I couldn't better with um, paint. So they remained as sketches. Um, this one here, if you remember, um, when Wilfred said about um, um, about the shell holes, some of them have been known to drown in them. This is uh, this is what's happening here. He's grabbing the backpack of this chap that's just fallen in um, again. So that that would be a hole similar to that. Again, they've got this this lunar almost lunar landscape that um, Owen describes it as no man's land. And you can see there's no exaggeration with the conditions. We curse through sludge. This image here, I had this painted originally, just of him like these wandering through the sludge, but it wasn't, it wasn't muddy enough. It wasn't, it wasn't difficult enough. Um, so I've uh, picked a line there from one of his uh, letters. After those two days, we were let down gently into the real thing, mud. So I almost, abstracted the image and lost the image by splashing mud upon mud and just had to decide when to stop. But look, you can see here, there's a, uh, an officer there with the waders on. I mean, imagine being sent to that and said, right, you're gonna hold this line for 12 days or four days or whatever it was. Uh, we curse through sludge, there's a pencil drawing. And um, since I set foot in Calais Keys, I have not had dry feet. Again, another line from Owen. And then I painted that image. And again, I decided to, to add this dynamic, these dynamic splashes of, of mud on there. This is an image, of course, a very well-known image that we referred to earlier. Till on the haunting flares, we turned our back. This is the sort of, at the time, at the, that moment, the showpiece image for me that was, that was delivering, um, giving me the confidence to, to, to work on this book. These are the flares, of course. If you've seen 1917, um, when uh, the, the soldier goes through a coost at night with the, the, the shadows 
and the way they move. Um, that's that's what he's describing and experiencing. Till on the haunting flares, we turned our backs. So I've got these men walking into the night. This one's caught caught up in the flare. This was the original drawing for this image, um, but uh, I think this is slightly better. It's, it's, it's uh, but nevertheless, there's a there's a freedom in the drawings. These ones made it into the book as they were. Um, he's given a piggyback, lost his boots. See, trench foot. When when they had trench foot, their their feet rotted and and uh, would have to be carried, and they were pretty much rendered useless until they um, till their feet healed. So it was um, the men would be put on a charge if after a while if they um, had uh, trench feet because they trench foot sorry they they'd have to um, dry their feet off daily if they could of course men march to sleep this image here I've got my I remember my dad telling me about when he was had a spell in the army and um, fell asleep when they won exercise and he fell asleep standing up and that always stuck with me so this chap's falling asleep and the others are holding him up. His gilet there that he's got is um, one that they would, the soldiers, I love these as a, as a visual description. These uh, soldiers would make these from, from skins of rabbits and goats and animals that they would find and eat, and then obviously utilize that to keep warm. Um, you can't imagine, there's some German soldiers, there's a British soldier, can't imagine what it must be like. Many had lost their boots, but limped on. So that's this image here. Um, again, as you can see from the inspiration that I've had before, um, uh, visually uh, with the references, you can see where I'm getting these images from. Bloodshot, so he's, he's dehumanizing the subject. He's, he's making them um, become like animals. Um, so that's what I'm trying to achieve here in these drawings. Again, this one's trying to help these get through. Um, they're very harrowing images. Um, and all went lame. So um, he's describing them again as horses and, and um, the, the injuries that um, you might expect from a, from a horse. Um, there's, I think this probably is a staged image, but it's a very powerful one nonetheless. Many had lost their boots, but limped on. So you can see here how I'd handled that with my dip pen. And here you can see an image that of, a, of a man that's just lost, partially buried in the, the mud to the side. Um, and again, we've got these images and we can see here, this soldier, he has got trench foot. You can see it's black, his foot's gone black. So he would be in trouble with his um, examining officer. All blind drunk with fatigue. Um, normally you'd say, oh, someone's blind drunk in a bar and they're having, they've had too much beer, but these guys are, are drunk with fatigue. Again, these are some reference, visual reference points that Owen's describing. And, uh, and otherworldly, you, I mean, if you got that as a film set without this happening, you would never have believed it and thought it was uh, ridiculous. Deaf even to the hoots of tired outstripped five nines that drop behind. Um, this is my image for that. But you'll see in here, um, when I was um, studying the, um, the original manuscripts, there were so many changes and some lovely things that, that um, haven't made it into the final or the perceived final version that I wanted to do, give a little nod to those. So I've ghosted some of these images in behind. And um, the five nine here, let me show you this. Um, here, is a, here is a five nine, that is a, a German five nine shell case. So this is the size and um, we've got, you've got the charge that would be on the top so it would, it's a substantial shell. And um, this, this is what Owen's talking about there. Um, let me just get back on there. And uh, it's a 15 centimeter, as we would say now, German howitzer shell, and it would have been uh, used to deliver high explosives and shrapnel. But it, uh, from 1916 onwards, it was also used to deliver gas. So um, he's describing this this gas attack. Um, there's a sketch that I originally had for this scene, but um, I was gonna have a, an observation balloon up there, but I felt that it detracted too much from the, uh, the main star of the show here, which was the gas. And uh, we can see here what the, the gas looked like. 
There's some interesting quotes that I've just dropped in here and there. The cynical and barbarous disregard of the well-known usages of civilized war. Sir, Sir John French uh, said that. Um, gas, gas, and this is how I wrote it. And the word gas is almost struggling with, with the effects of gas. That's what I'm trying to do here. And in the interests of balance, we've got here, war was nothing to do with chivalry anymore. The higher civilization rises, the viler man becomes. General Karl von Einem, commander of the third German army in France. We've got gas helmets here. I'm just gonna skip through these because these are the, how the, the development of the, of the gas helmets um, started. These were the first ones, which were just simple um, muslin tied around the faces with goggles. Then that was developed to the black veil respirator. And this was again, very similar, but they learned that um, if they put an, an ammonia solution on here, it would, it would um, diffuse the effects of the gas. So we all know where you can get an, an amount of ammonia from. They would have um, a bucket of urine there. So if they've heard the gas alarm, they could dip that in and put that around their mouth. Kind of wonder what's worse really, but um, that's pretty horrific. Very quickly, they designed these hypo helmet, British smoke hoods. There's some in, an Indian regiment there testing these, trialing these out. Then we have a, a pH tube helmet. I mean, a stuff of nightmares, it just looks horrific. A PH helmet there offers um, greater uh, protection. And then we've got a PHG helmet. And this was uh, the standard PH helmet with goggles. And that was, um, that gives a, a slightly easier freedom of movement um, for the artillerymen. Large box respirator, again, just looks, looks really scary if you ask me. Um, but that developed into this, which was um, the small box respirator, which is what Owen would have recognized. And again here, I've got, uh, I've got one of those and um, you can see in here, I got all these when I was doing my research. So um, you can see that um, trying to get this out and put it on in the panic of gas would have been a, would have been a really um, terrible thing to have to try and contend with as well as fight. Um, so these are, this is what I, Wilfred's talking about. So I decided to start sketching these, these soldiers, putting their gas helmets on. And um, there's another quote here on gas. On hearing the gas alert, Henry V before the Battle of Agincourt knelt down and prayed. This is exactly what I did, Captain E. Simons. And then gas, gas, again, these, these pencil drawings, I couldn't re, um, recreate the looseness and the reportage feel that I created with these. So they remained as pencil drawings. Here's my gas, the green sea that Owen describes in the poem. So I create that, blow that up, drop the, the, the pencil drawings over the top. Again, look, we've got some, we've got some little um, uh, lines here that didn't make it into the final cut. I definitely wanted them in my book. And um, an ecstasy of fumbling. Again, this was an image I was going to paint, but um, just literally, it's almost half finished, but I just loved it, how loose and free that was. This is a more finished approach, but you'll see here, I've started to give the eyes, because they're clear, um, so you could see the eyes, but I've created these as like lights and creating a, a, a skull-like approach. To these, um, to these masks, but someone still was yelling out and stumbling. So these have got theirs on, they're looking over at this poor chap. Um, and this is, this is that chap, this is the, the victim's viewpoint. So he's starting to see these nightmarish, distorted um, images of his comrades that are gonna come over and try and help him. And floundering like a man in fire or lime, this I wanted to create um, like a, a deadly uh, wisp of gas um, reminiscent of the angel of death in Egypt at the night of the Passover. That's what I was trying to establish here, like wisping be be between the, um, the men. Again, we've got some images here that are um, uh, uh, 
educational for the soldiers. Dim through the misty panes of thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. I'm starting to distort this person now. Um, he's, he's becoming less human and becoming more of one of these nightmarish uh, uh, characters. He's looking round and these uh, uh, men are trying to pull him out of the mud. Um, there's just a, the four main um, gases that were used in the First World War and the description is clear that it's, it's chlorine gas that he's referring to. Um, and then there's another one here, which is an interesting one. I cannot see the difference between killing a man with chemical substance and rendering him to pieces with explosions. The first named form of death, as a matter of fact, is the most merciful. Um, that's quite a controversial thing to say. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. Again, he's now distorting, he's contorting, his face is expanding, his eyes are bulging, um, and he's losing, losing sight of these men. He's having a red out, if you like. Um, that's what I'm trying to achieve here. And in all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me. This poor soul's got shell shock. And um, I have this guy here who is remembering his time in the war. And um, uh, we can analyze this image in greater detail. But this is a nice line I put with this just for myself. I try not to remember these things now from the century. It's, it's such a powerful, powerful line. Anyone that knows me with my work puts a little bit of myself in there. In the background, we've got this chest of drawers with this um, uh, bronze sculpture on there. This is, I bought Emily this um, years ago now. So I just put that in, that's for her in this image. And then we've got here, the old man's teeth are in his glass and he's got um, some medication maybe to help him sleep and to, to, to um, deal with his, his shell shock, uh, sorry, his, his ghostly memories. Watching, we hear the mad gust tugging on the wire like twitching agonies of men among its brambles. Here we are, this is from exposure. And um, these are maybe the reminiscences of men that were caught on the wire. And uh, these are the men whose mind the dead have ravished. Memory fingers in their hair of murders, multitudinous murders they once witnessed. And this guy here is really a nod to my great uncle because in my family, they said that right up until he died when he was an old man in his eighties, he would wake up screaming in cold sweats, having nightmares about what he'd experienced so many years earlier. So that's what we're doing here. And again, look at this, this is mustard gas, um, nightmares creatures. Um, in some smothering dreams, if, if, if in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in. I didn't want a vision of him in the wagon at this point, just the arm, the, the, the version of him there just hanging out the back. So he's, he's clumsily put in there. And uh, this was the first sketch in my sketchbook of, of that. It's the only pastiche really of, could be Owen, but it's, it's, it could be a veteran. And it's, um, that image of you walking through somewhere in your pajamas when you're having a nightmare and you, you can't quite get where you're supposed to get. Um, and again, here, this is highlighting the lights in the eyes as we're moving through the, um, the mud um, and the gas has already affected um, the horses here. Again, look at the conditions, utterly horrendous. And watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, what a line that is. Eyeballs bulged like squids, watch my dreams still from the, from the century. So I've now created this person's head is becoming a gas mask. So his eyes are bulging like squids and he's frothing at the mouth. So a deeply unpleasant um, image, like a devil sick of sin. This image was, was again something I couldn't rest until I've got it down. We'll go through this one. The devil sat on a pile of bodies and um, he's got, um, he's collected the dog tags of the dead around him. And the more he collects, the more he consumes, the thinner he gets. I didn't want to have him with a tail and a fork. I wanted him to be this emaciated character. For visual balance, there's a symmetry of rigor mortis. 
going on. So we can see the horse's leg there and we can see the soldier's leg here. And again, for balance of good and evil, e uh, good and evil, we've got um, the crucifixion, Golgotha in the background, but no Christ on the tree uh, on this because he's not the sacrifice on the, this occasion. All these men are the sacrifice, but there will be a new dawn. There will be a, a, a tomorrow. Um, so we must always remember that. In that image, I've hidden a little Robin Redbreast, uh, a witness to this, and as at the crucifixion, because the, the, the legend goes that the Robin got his red breast by catching its chest on the crown of thorns at the crucifixion. Also a nod to Owen's brother officer, uh, Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant Gort Roger. Gas masks are morphing into skulls here. And um, the gas helmets, they're not lit. These men are dead. I see your lights, but ours had long gone out. For, again, another line from the century. Um, and then this one here, the rats. Um, this reminded me of, um, for hours the innocent mice rejoiced, the house is theirs. Shutters and doors all closed, on us the doors are closed. We turn back to our dying. A line from exposure, but they're not rats in my image. They're, uh, sorry, they're not mice, they're rats. Um, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer. That just didn't work enough. It wasn't powerful enough. So I turned the line red and um, we're almost losing consciousness here with the victim. Um, and again, we've got these zombie sort of nightmarish characters um, coughing up blood um, and uh, just deeply unpleasant really. Uh, bitter as the cud of filing, vile incurable sores and innocent tongues. There's the innocent and there's the vile incurable sores. So um, I think that kind of tells its own story, really. My friend, again to Jesse Pope, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. I didn't want to make, I didn't want to draw any more than that. That's that's an iconic image, the white feather that was handed out to soldiers or to boys and men who had not gone to war for whatever reason at that point, and they were branded a coward and handed the white feather. So I think that says everything we need to know. And um, again, we've got this, uh, this image of um, women say go. There's blood on their hands. So these people that are saying you've got to go, whether they're the poster maker, um, designer, or a poet, or a, um, there's, there's blood on their hands. So this image, I literally just painted my hand and splatted it on a piece of paper. So um, that's kind of it. I wish it was more dramatic. Uh, tricky than that but it there is no other secret the old lie so we've got this this line here of this this character lying in the in the smoke and you can just make out the horse in the background here not the smoke the gas sorry and then the winter's here and the character's still there this body's still there frozen in time and um there we have the ghosts these are all the ghosts you can see their eyes have gone dark like they were in the in the gas masks where the eyes, the lights had gone out. And um, we have a repetition of the opening scene, but it's now in mourning at the back. So the, the, the images become a dark image. This is an interesting line. If we could only be inoculated against thinking, how much more bearable the war would be. Um, that's a lovely line. And then of course we have Wilfred's death on the 4th of November. Uh, this is my sketch um, of the canal, the Sambrois Canal, where he was killed trying to cross. And I ran up to the to this point here, which is where this is, and put a cross in the ground and took some pictures. Um, then on the 11th, it's a well-known fact that on the 11th of November, as the as the bells were ringing out for armistice, Susan Owen, his mother, received her her telegram. And that's a little sketch I put in the book. She's knocked the table over, the bars and um, a quick preliminary sketch of, mother's, of a mother's anguish. There's Wilfred's grave. There's my sketches of his grave with, I wrote the, the, the words for strange meeting there. And one of my favorite lines he ever wrote, some say God caught them even before they fell. So again, we've got this character almost in chalk, slumped over, that's been sacrificed in the back. And lastly, 
we've got this image here of when I said to you about um, uh, Sarah Road number two and my great uncle being buried there, we located the exact spot via, via GPS of where um, uh, Wilfred came under attack in that dugout. And I went and got some soil, uh, some clay soil from that moment, uh, from that place. And I brought it home and I mixed it with water. And I had these stretcher bearers going and I splashed this mud across this image. And um, this line always, uh, I think this is a fitting way to finish. And Wilfred wrote in a letter, I came out in order to help these boys directly by leading them as well as an officer can, indirectly by watching their sufferings that I may speak of them as well as a pleader can. I have done the first. And then there we are, there's a photograph I took at, um, at the uh, Forester's house. And that concludes my talk. I hope you found that interesting. Marvellous. Thank and you how so did you much. Sleep? How did you, you sleep creating all this? I, to be honest, Elizabeth, that was, that was something that uh, Emily said that she, she noticed that my mood would constantly change. Um, and um, yes, I did. I can honestly say it did affect me, but um, if if you're going to do it justice, you've got to put your heart and soul into it. It's not a text that deserves a quick, you know, spend a week on it and then start working on it. You, you've got to give it justice. So hopefully that is what I did. But you went at su in such depth and put yourself through all that. Oh my goodness, John. Oh. Thank you. Do you have any other questions from anyone? There were a few things in the chat, which I oh, just okay. thought I'd read out um, just to say, just to acknowledge that people have put things in um, that Meg had said her mother born in 1913 remembered how as a small child, she had been got out of bed in her parents' house in Golders Green to watch the flaming Zeppelin falling down the sky. Oh, wow. It also featured an episode of Upstairs Downstairs. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Indeed. And um, I just put in that weirdly, um, today is also Jesse Pope's birthday. So oh. um, happy birthday, Jesse Pope, who I do, I agree, think gets a very bad rap, but uh, that's for another discussion. Yeah. Um, and um, Marin Williams had put in, men really did march to sleep. My grandfather who was in the First World War told me so. Mm. And then we've had a lot of amazing, fantastic talks. Uh, fantastic. Uh, it's a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, but we've got a raised hand and I think iPhone three is Chris Bent. So Chris, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yep. Thanks, Jane. And thanks to saying unmute because I probably wouldn't have. Um, uh, oh, Martin, just a uh, massive thanks. I, I've, I've so loved that. Uh, just a couple of commentary and no real question in it. Uh, firstly, I can see the brilliant link and the emotion you've you've really drawn through it all by kind of following his life wilfred's life and, and kind of how that you can link the the normality almost of his life to what became the uh, the horror that all the soldiers went through uh, during that war uh, and, and have created something so inspirational uh, and i would say the poem you chose i think your, your book is just wondrous um and i think the um, the fact that that it almost is the uh, image of, uh, oh, if you had to pick something out of it. What I would like to say in particular about your book is, um, I think when you read poetry or, or read a book or see a film, when you've got something like that, like that in your head, uh, very often uh, you create your own images and it's very hard when somebody else comes in to say, these are my images. Uh, and not, I have to say, normally when I've done something like that, they don't quite match. It's, it, it's not a right or a wrong. They just don't quite match the images I had. And when I bought your book, I have to say, those images massively enhanced how I felt about that poem. Oh, they, God. you know, I, I genuinely mean that. It, uh, it took it to a different level. Uh, emotionally and uh, so uh, so there's no question coming out of this but it's just a great opportunity for me to say thank you so much for I didn't think I could feel any better about that poem from Owen 
and you definitely have taken it to a, a different level. So thank you so much for what you've done. Well, that's that's incredibly kind of you. Um, and I really do appreciate that because I was terrified taking it on. And, um, and I was, you know, so... I'm so pleased that I was able to deliver something that an aud the audience, you guys would feel was acceptable. So I'm I'm deeply touched and and I'm very proud of those comments. So thank you. And actually, Martin, I'll finish that off. The uh, I, I do loads of work with schools uh, about their uh, not Wolf Doan necessarily, but just their experiences about uh, remembrance and a. And obviously, every opportunity I get, uh, I, I throw Wilfred Owen's uh, story and journey into it. And uh, incredibly, I'm, I'm so careful about not being too, particularly for primary school, not being so in your face for something that's pretty difficult to talk about and be very careful about that. But actually, the kids all dive into uh, Duce de Cormet. That's the poem and, the, and the, the lines they pull out of it where I'm tiptoeing around it. There's no way with them. They're right into the sharp end. So uh, it's lovely hearing you talk, talk at the start of your, your, your uh, talk tonight. Uh, it's great for me to say I, I, I get the same reaction from these children that actually they, it really resonates. You know, um, I've, there are so many that I've had over the last few years would have loved to have heard this talk tonight. So I'll be pointing them to the YouTube. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. All right, you're welcome. Thank you, Chris. Anyone else want to ask a question or pose a comment? Nora, yes, please. That's truly amazing, Martin, and very, very moving. I think you've been alongside Wilfred throughout. Thank you so much. Oh, Nora, thank, thank you so much for that, because um, I can honestly say when I went up to the, the house some evenings, I would say to Emily that the studio was very, was very crowded because I felt that I connected so much with these, these uh, men uh, from, from a forgotten time. And, um, and thankfully, because of associations like this and us and our enthusiasm, they won't ever be forgotten because we will tell our children and, and the story carries on. But yeah, it was... It, it was, it's, I, I genuinely felt that when I was able to handle his, his, uh, his um, manuscripts and to, to be entrusted with that. And like I say, Jane was instrumental in me getting that. And I must say that without putting myself as Wilfred Owen, Jane is, Jane is my Siegfried Sassoon to me being Wilfred Owen because I simply could not have done this book without Jane. She, she was absolutely my mentor throughout. And it, it's every bit her book as it is mine. It's, and I was so proud that she selflessly gave me so much time and helped me. So, you know, it's a big nod and thanks to you, Jane. Oh, well, that's, that's well, more than Jane. generous of you actually, but um, I'm sure Sassoon is spinning in his grave as he hears that. <laughs> he could be a bit mean, Jane, but we're not. Oh, thank you. thank you. Any other comments or questions about Martin's process or anything? Martin, I wanted to ask. Um, yes. We did we did review your book in the journal, but after this talk, I, I'd really love it if we could collaborate on some sort of article with of with your sketches and and how you how you proceeded. Can we do that? Of course, yeah, yeah. it'd be a pleasure. I'd love it. I'm yeah, sure I'll read it too. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, sorry, Chris, did you? Well, sorry, I'm coming in again, aren't I? Uh, uh, just one thing I'd particularly like to ask Martin. I've had a few people who are close but not so close to, uh, to Owen's uh, poetry and story uh, who challenged me about this poem, saying, Owen really didn't have much personal experience about gas. Um, I ju just uh, appreciate your knowledge and your feedback about that, that statement. Well, I, I don't think he, he experienced um, gas as he's describing in Dolce at the Corum Est, because I think he would have been very vocal about that in his letters. But right. I think his experiences um, with the mustard gas and then 
having seen what the consequences of gas attacks. I don't think you have to be too creative in your writing and um, to put a, a message across. I mean, I've created this body of work, but I wasn't in the First World War. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, we don't have to always experience the thing ourselves. But that's as. But I'm sure um, Paul or someone like that would would be more knowledgeable about um, whether our inexperienced. Um, any further gas attacks? Are you familiar with that, Paul? As far as I know, and as, as far as I think most of the other Orphan critics know, you're, you're correct that Owen didn't actually undergo that specific kind of experience. Um, on the other hand, he does refer in his letters somewhere, and Jane will probably tell us where, uh, to the fact that he'd been on a gas training course. So he was certainly trained in the official um, methods for dealing with gas and of recognizing, you know, the, the symptoms and the signs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he actually says uh, he made some uh, small suggestions about how the, the masks uh, might be and the respirators might be improved. Whether anybody took any notice of him, I don't know. Oh, brilliant. That's why you asked Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, uh, reading through some of the letters, I have to say, I bumped into uh, references to uh, when he's been coming back with wounded soldiers, some of which had been affected by gas. So he may not have had a gas attack directly, mm. but it's pretty obvious he's seen the impact of gas mm. to some of the soldiers coming, uh, you know, coming uh, to the casualty clearance stations or beyond. So, yeah, I get that. But just say it's, uh, it's really interesting for me in terms of everything he went through the poem that will most resonate with him is, is probably not one through personal experience, you know, in terms of, uh, of gas. I have a real feel for this because my grandfather suffered badly through, through gassing, survived the First World War. Um, so, you know, for me, and, and it is the poem that seems to resonate so much, but you're right, uh, here we are talking so well about him. And we've never been gassed. So why would we not have a, yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally get that, Martin, yeah. Thank you. It, it might also be worth mentioning, Martin, um, you referred to Owen's little epigraph to Jesse Pope, which he later ditched. But the dreadful Horatio Bottomley, mm. who was yes. this sort of ghastly demagogue, but he, he went on a visit, semi-official visit to France in 1917 and wrote a series of articles about it, mainly um, proclaiming how brave he'd been and what wonderful things he'd done and seen and so on. But there is a passage in there which is almost the complete inversion of Dulce de Corum Est, where instead of marching away from the trenches in the dark uh, and falling into the gas, Bottomley starts behind the lines in daylight and is escorted up through the support tent trenches <clears throat> somewhere within sight of the front line. And at one point, he is offered by his military escorts a gas mask. And he says, I put it on, and I can't remember the exact wording, but he says it was absolutely dreadful. I couldn't possibly wear that. I'd rather have the gas. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, if Owen and Sassoon, either of them, had read that article, you can imagine the kind of reaction to that flippancy. Um, and I, I think there's a case for suggesting that my friend, you would not tell this, that and the other, at least has bottomly as much in mind as Jesse Pope. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah and because, because the original has Jesse Pope, etc. She was yes. only symptomatic of a wider sort of, you know, raw raw attitude to the war so that's why i think even though one of them says a certain poetess i still think one of the reasons that was removed for the very reasons that you talk about paul that it was you know it wasn't just one person no um it was many people who didn't didn't get it yeah. Yeah. and there were of course uh, I won't say huge numbers, but there were a number of other soldier poets writers in uniform who used that phrase, Dulce et decorum est, entirely unironically. And there, were, there were two or three collections, so, uh, soldier poetry and more poems by the soldier poets, 
uh, which contain poems under that title, which simply say, yes, it is a wonderful thing, and that's what we all ought to do. Mm. So Owen had plenty in his mind, I think, when, when he came to that particular poem. Mm. Francis, you had a question. Um, yes, yeah, so it was really just, it's another observation, really. Um, just um, from what Meg was saying about writing an article about how you made, how you made your this vision for the book, because um, it sounds very much like um, your observation of Owen's life and of the experiences are like his creation of poetry and his his use of observation. And I was really interested in the use of the mud for your colour scheme, oh, yeah. um, and also the. Um, the depiction of the white feather is the first time I thought that that reminded me of a quill, you know, which a writer would use, which was a response to writers and that connection. So I thought, um, I mean, as Meg said, that it would be really great to have an article just explaining that creation process because it's so it's so in sync, I think, with Owen's. Mm. Yeah, well, that's that's. Uh... I never thought of it as uh, as being a quill, um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. So from now on, I shall make out that I meant that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that's that's a great uh, observation, Francis. Thank you for that. Yes, yeah, I just I just wanted to um, to to have a simple image because I didn't want to have a depiction of anyone in particular. Um, so I felt that if I had a this symbolic uh, image on there. Um, that would be, that would, and also encourage, you know, um, an understanding of what that is, what, you know, so many of us will get what that is straight away, but the whole point in creating something is also, especially if it's for someone's memory, is to, to, to enhance um, uh, the questions that will be asked and, and like that little spark that someone Someone might have come on here tonight that might join the association, might think, oh, I didn't know that about some of the other poems that I was mentioning, maybe. I don't know. And then, you know, the journey starts. So, yeah, it's, it's really interesting, though, that you say that about, um, about the writing. So I was so close, I didn't even see that. So that's brilliant. Thank you. Chris. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I beg your pardon, Chris. Sorry, Marcy, I, I just wanted to say one thing that hasn't been said uh, about your wonderful book is uh, the thing that most struck me about it, and, I, and I, I didn't expect to be so moved by it as I was, um, but the thing that, the word that comes through for me, uh, having, you know, when you finish the book, uh, is atmosphere. Mm. Uh, and it, the words are amazing, and we've been so familiar with that, uh, and your drawings are, are incredible. I, I, I was so... Um, surprised how the connection you got between the words and, and, and the image of, of what was going on. Uh, and I think the word is atmosphere, but I found it was an actually deeply disturbing. Uh, yeah. The words are disturbing, but I found your drawings and the fact they were linked so beautifully. Uh, I was incredibly uncomfortable. It took me ages to go through it. I, I, I read two or three and left it and came back to it, you know, and I, and I think it was because of that, it felt the imagery you, you portrayed uh, made the uncomfortable feeling tenfold. So that's a massive compliment to what you achieved. Oh, well, thank you. And, and um, it had to be. I, I you know, the, the words are deeply disturbing. Yeah. Owen wants them to be deeply disturbing. He wants the, you know, it, it, it's, it's uh, in the same way that, that Sassoon is posting his his um, public letter condemning you know the the process and you know uh, willfully continuing the war when they have the powers to end it it's it, the the poems are are meant to be seen in a disturbing the, the people are supposed to be revolted by it and um, and sympathetic for it with it's have sympathy with the subject and the people in it so I couldn't, I, I had to. The, the only one that I was worried about was the devil because I knew I wanted this, this emaciated creature um, huddled over this, this mound of bodies. 
Um, but I, I, I was very careful not to make it um, so it could look vaguely humorous. I wanted it to look deeply upsetting because if this is a scene that even the devil's sick of, then it has to be something utterly revolting and utterly despicable, which of course, you know, war is. So mm. I couldn't hide behind the images and you certainly can't hide behind Owen's words mm. because he, he puts them straight back out there and you have to, if you want to do them justice, you've got to understand where he's coming from. Martin, uh, one little detail, which I don't think I've seen discussed anywhere else, which, which your uh, talk reminded me of uh, early on in that letter where he talks about being in the dugout and the sentry who was blinded. And that, of course, brings up a, a theme which is, is lurking in a lot of his poems, including this one, about his own responsibility to his men and mm. whether he's discharged that adequately or not and could he have done more for them, et cetera, et cetera. But you, you, reading the letter, you, you brought out the sentence as well, which I'd not thought about very much, which is that one of the lads who was killed, not the one who was blinded, but one of the ones who was killed was my previous servant. Mm. I dismissed. And that suddenly, it, it brought home to me that this, this must have occurred to Owen that, you know, what made him dismiss him? It's probably something trivial. You know, he didn't clean his boots properly or he was late or he brought him the wrong drink or something like that. And he said, oh, I can't be bothered with this. Get me somebody else. And the consequence of that is mm. that this lad is now dead. Mm. And that's nothing to do with military sort of action in the trenches. It's simply one of the consequences of him putting on the uniform and all those insignia that you showed us. He has now become enmeshed in this, well, it's not a system, whatever you like to call it. But it's just that one little detail. And, and again, thank you very much for, for highlighting that for me. Oh, that's, yeah, that's brilliant, Paul. Thank you. Um, and I just feel that um, when he's... What I the 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 point that I um, highlighted in that as well was I could see a link between that comment and the old man asleep with his nightmares in his bed because clearly straight away Owen is having an element of survivor's guilt and I think had he have lived through the war and come home I think he would have struggled immensely. With, with ordinary life and the fact that he was alive. And I mean, a friend of mine um, uh, took a lot of veterans out back in the eighties out to, the, to France. And um, one of them um, has said as an old man in his late eighties, um, they went to, to um, I think it's at Sanctuary Wood or somewhere near there, there's a cemetery. And he said, there's all my, these are all my pals. And, you know, they died in their teens. And this old man, you know, 70 years, 75 years later, his request was to have his ashes taken and scattered back with his, with his friends. And I think, I think Owen would have, would have really struggled with it. Um, and if, and I mean this with the utmost respect to Owen, but in a way, his story had to end like it did because it's, you could not make that up, that he died and his mother found out of his death on Armistice Day. If you were writing a movie and you put that in, everyone would say, you've got to take that out, that's ridiculous. Mm. But it's so powerful, it's, it's, it's just perfect for him and his, his wider story in history. It's horrible, it's not perfect, and we hate the fact that he was taken so young. But in the grand scheme of things, it's, it, it resonates, it ripples through time even more because of that fact. And um, it was almost destined that that was going to have to be. The, and that last letter from the Forester's House, it has to be. I mean, I just I can't I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it now. It's just it's just such an incredible human being. And and I'm so sorry that he went when he did. But wow, what a legacy and what a what a gift he left us all and what a connection to the past he gave us, each and every one of us that care to look into his work.
Well, I think that's um, um, an amazing sort of quote, I guess, to end on. We've gone over time, but I think oh, it's been sorry. a, no, an amazing, um, we could probably talk for hours, um, but I think you've kind of summed up so beautifully what, you know, this sort of, um, why we gather together, why Owen's work still has resonance and especially picking out the letter that he wrote to Colin and the words that you highlighted as something that could easily be written at this moment. And so I think what you just said, Martin, really sums up um, the sort of power of his work. And it's been a joy to hear how you made the connections to create this visual image of of what is a really iconic poem, but you've given it a new kind of resonance. And um, can I just ask everyone to thank Martin so much again for a really fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I will have nightmares tonight, I think. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth. <laughs> But um, we look visual. forward to seeing everyone at other events and um, wishing you again a happy Wilfred Owen's birthday. This will be available on YouTube soon. And um, everyone, please stay well. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, Thank you. That was brilliant.